What if I told you that good things happen when women back, support, and invest in other women? Hello, my name is Andrea Chakava, and I'm an investment professional. I am a crusader and a voice for women in finance. My claim to fame is that I was the youngest managing director of a non-family-owned business in the year 2008. I thrived in an industry that is male-dominated. I am also one of the few women in Africa to have co-founded a fund management company. Sounds good, doesn't it? Well, well, I didn't know that until it all went away. You see, um, when we look at all these things that we've been basically exposed to, I had a career that was basically, I would say, supported by men. They were able to put me in these positions that I would consider to be very influential. And they worked well with me, and they provided wisdom along the way. But I would like to observe when things didn't go exactly as they planned, they were quick to throw me under the bus. You see, for a long time, I had no idea how the world truly worked. I lived in a girly bubble. So I am from an all-girl household. Um, I'm basically lucky to be blessed with parents that supported our career choices and allowed us to be what we could be. The mantra in the household was, whatever you do, you do it well. To add a further estrogen effect, I went to an all-girls school. Yes, I'm a Loretto sister. I'm a Sungari alumni, to be precise. And there are alpha females, I can call them, and plenty of them are changing society in more ways than one. So, for most of my early childhood, I was surrounded by strong women. I was never exposed to the preferential treatment of boys. That is, until I got the title director to my name. So let's take this context and we go to the work environment. Um, so after my undergraduate degree in Canada, I got a job here locally at a leading fund management company. And we basically pioneered retail investing in Kenya. And um, we changed people's savings habits. We offered good returns on the money markets, on the equity markets, and we did really well. We grew the fund from nothing to $100 million. I didn't do this alone. I had a team, a team I would like to fondly remember as the dream team. And when I reflect, I think they were a reflection of myself. They were young, they were hungry, they were eager to, eager to prove themselves, and they were mostly female. Also, one thing I discovered in my career is that women feel more comfortable when they see other women. You see, our client base, without a deliberate, targeted, or marketing effort, ended up being 40% female. Central Bank of Kenya released statistics saying women own about 82% of savings account. And when you go back and you look at the purchasing power, women are acknowledged globally for influencing decisions, from the houses we live in, to the clothes we wear, to the cars we buy. So they are a powerful force to reckon with. Because of that performance, I was basically promoted to a larger subsidiary. This time, the mandate was bigger. It was a billion-dollar fund. The responsibility was more about turnaround, operational efficiency, change management. And I inherited a team. And this team was mostly male. 
At that point, I suffered a whole host of hostility, and it was from both male and female colleagues. They questioned everything. They questioned my age. They questioned my marital status. They even questioned my ability, despite the successful track record. And after it was hurtful and disappointing, and after two years at the helm. I said, you know, I'm going to make a choice to go to business school. And my decision to go to business school was basically fueled by my intellectual curiosity to find a renewed sense of purpose. You see, after being at the same institution for a period of eight years, I felt that I had suppressed my own identity. So after business school, I went, and I was at. Um, Cass Business School in London, and business school was an eye opener. We were a cohort of seventy; about a third of it was female. We were from twenty different nationalities. I met so many like-minded individuals, and some of them had experiences just like mine. But what was interesting, because I was in London in 2010, and that was post-financial crisis. And the literature was coming out about how could this crisis have been averted? How could it have been mitigated? And scholars were looking at the members of, you know, some of the companies that had done exceptionally badly, and there were tales of hubris, there were tales of groupthink, everything that was attributed to a lack of diversity. You see, there was very little tendency to. Challenge and debate decisions of very powerful chairmen and CEOs, a reckless enjoyment of risk, because people look the same. They are of the same age, all of the same gender, mostly the same race, similar background, similar experiences, and people started asking, "Where were the women in the boardroom?" Where are the women in senior management? And a global movement was born. For me, that was—it was healing. It was like I was able to now join the dots and finally understand the patronizing attitude that I had sometimes endured in the workplace. You see, culture norms and the lack of visibility of other female leaders has limited our perception as seeing. Women as achievers. So it's easy for us to undervalue the female contribution in the workplace because we have dictated for so long the roles that women play in the household, and this bias it exists amongst different peer groups. It's not an old thing or a young thing. It exists amongst males and females, and it's referred to as the conscious bias. Imagine somebody that grew up in a home where their mom was a home executive. They may have a problem just reporting to a woman leader in the office. So I got to understand that I'm not the norm in financial services. I am not the norm in the business environment. I was an outlier, and in order for outliers to be accepted, we had to breed a culture of tolerance. And how do you do that? You just create more outliers. So I challenge you to be more outliers. And so, I also decided that because I had this confidence and leaving business school, I didn't want to use my first name Laura anymore. I decided to use my middle name, Andia. And Andia is a Marigoli name, and it means the one who survived. And that's how I saw myself as a warrior. In a male-dominated environment, that sometimes attributed their respect for women due to their marital status or the type of family that they hailed from. So when I came back to Kenya, I was enthusiastic and ready to start all over again. And I joined up with local investors who all happened to be men, and we started an African investment company. It was bold. It was Visionary and it was ambitious. We engaged in 
in fund management and investment advisory activities, and we were making traction in what is a very long-term game. But you know what? Unconscious bias reared its ugly head again, and this time I could spot it a mile away. It was a different institution, but it was a similar experience. But you know what had changed? Me, my attitude. Because I had already told myself, when I'm restarting my career, I am going to align myself with strong women. So I joined a network of women in finance called New Faces, New Voices, which is a pan-African advocacy group affiliated with the Grash and Michelle Trust in 17 African countries. And I met senior women in corporate, of successful women entrepreneurs across the continent. And our job was not to complain about the status quo, no, but to, you know. Stimulate research and advocate for a better work environment for the female leaders of tomorrow. So when my new venture didn't go exactly as I anticipated, I looked and I thought, you know, all this time I have been hired by men to bring their vision into fruition, and I have done it. And I've barely gotten credit for it. What have I done for women, apart and employ them? So I decided that I would marry, basically, my professional experience in investment with my passion for women economic advancement, and we would create. I would look at creating a spearhead initiative of a customized vehicle that would suit women's investment needs. You see, throughout my course and my career, I have participated in capital raising for companies, and I have never been involved in a transaction for less than five million dollars. So yes, I was meeting these women entrepreneurs. They were running successful businesses, but you know what? They they were not at that size, that radar, that investors would basically look at them. Investors would be like a five million dollar deal. Don't you have ten million, twenty million dollars? So it's okay for women to run businesses for subsistence purposes, but it also has to. There's also a new group that was coming up that wanted to grow. And on a further look, I found out that women are comfortable just using their savings and family and friends to basically grow their business. An unsustainable approach. There was also another complaint that women made, and they said, "You know, we experience a bias. Something I wasn't surprised. I'm from a male-dominated industry, and you know what? People tend to back things that they relate to, and if most of the funders are male, they'll just give more male entrepreneurs the funding. So it's a gap I am willing to stand, and it's a gap I'm willing to address." But it's not something I can do on my own. You see, I need all of us to really believe in ourselves, because we've all been knocked down at some point. But we need to keep pushing and pushing, and use those scars as a source of strength. I've had to reinvent myself three times after two career disappointments. From a senior corporate leader to a student to an entrepreneur, and now I feel at home as an impact investor, advocating and promoting inclusive investment. And these are the things that we can do. And once we look at our scars as a source of strength, and we see that beauty, we can see the beauty in others. And what do we do? We pay it forward. We invest and support other women. This is besides the Facebook likes and the retweets. I'm talking about put our money where our mouth is. We pull a vehicle together, and we create patient capital because we want the businesses to grow. And what do we achieve? Well, I believe investors are one of the most powerful stakeholders that can change behavior. You see, women become owners, so you basically participate in the returns. But you get to make sure products and services are customized, 
We also make sure, as well, that we have governance structures that have a critical mass at the non-exec level, and we basically have a strong pipeline of senior management leaders. And one of the killers that prevents women advancement in the workplace is culture, the hidden bias of culture, and the HR policies that can be discriminatory, and the supplier practices that are not equitable. So, we can basically change the world when we choose to invest together, and that's why I say to you, good things happen when women back, support, and invest other women. It's about time women begin to fund other women in business. Thank you.